Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's really nice to be here today to be able to talk about the BAT1K project. And the goals of the BAT1K project are to be able to sequence, make chromosome level assemblies, and to make publicly available the, the genomes of all living bat species. The reason for this is we want to be able to catalog the unique genetic endowments and the diversity present in living bats so that we can understand the molecular basis of their unique adaptations, link genotype with phenotype, and really understand what it is in these bat genomes that give them these unique genetic endowments, and uncover their evolutionary history, and overall better understand, promote, and conserve bats. So who we are, this uh, consortium was started by myself and Emma Teerling at University College Dublin. We also have an executive committee with including Jean Myers from the Max Planck Institute in Dresden, Liliana Davlos, Tom Gilbert, David Ray, and Michael Hiller. And together we've been working to build this consortium, including uh, researchers from around the world, uh, currently counted at about 180 members. And these members include not just geneticists and genomicists and computer scientists, but also the people who work with bats in the field, bat biologists, ecologists, and behavioralists, as well as conservation scientists. I should say we're also closely affiliated with the Genome 10K Project and the Vertebrate Genome Project. Now, the bat family tree is quite large. As you can see in this phylogenetic tree, there's 21 different bat families. And this makes up more than 1,300 different species. So this is quite an ambitious goal to be able to sequence to a high level the genomes of all 1,300 species. But before I go into what we've been doing and how we're going to do it with the Bat Genome Project, I want to spend a little bit of time to explain why I think it's so important that we sequence bat genomes. Why is it that bats are special and why should we be investing in these bat genomes? What can we learn from them? Well, one thing that's immediately clear when you start looking at bats is the extraordinary diversity that you can see. If we take, for example, just the size of bats. Now, this is one of the uh, biggest bats that you can see, the uh, golden-capped fruit bat uh, with a wingspan of almost six foot. So that's quite an impressive creature that's getting itself up into the air and flying around. If we look at the other end of the spectrum, the smallest bat actually also represents the smallest mammal. It's the bumblebee bat that fits on the end of your finger. Again, uh, presenting interesting metabolic challenges for such a tiny mammal. We can also see lots of other markers of diversity. For example, here's the Chapin's free-tailed bat that has its own little mohawk that it uses to distribute scent to attract a female. A lot of the echolocating bats have very interesting facial features, like these nose leaves of the horseshoe bat that it uses to echolocate. This is a bat that I'm often asked, is it actually real, because it looks so cartoonish, but I can assure you it is. The hammerhead bat does exist, uh, even though it looks very unusual. We see bats, for example, with these very large ears, like the spotted bat. Something that looks a lot more sort of mammalian, these big-eyed flying foxes that often people refer to as sky poppies and some beautiful bats like the painted bat here with this gorgeous coloring. So just looking at these six examples, you can see just how much diversity, just at a face value, we see in bats. But there's a lot of other features that make them truly special and worthy of study. For example, bats are the only flying mammals. So they're not gliders, they're capable of true self-powered flight. And powered flight has only evolved three times in vertebrates, in pterosaurs, birds, and bats. So if we can study the genomes of bats, we can try and understand why and how wings capable of powered flight evolved in this family, and what genomic factors led to this evolution. This also makes bats a really interesting model for limb development. Bats also have some special properties when it comes to lifespan. Many bats are known to be extremely long-lived. Now, most mammals fall along the scale of the bigger you are, the longer you live. So an elephant lives for a very long time, whereas many rodents live very short lives. But bats, as you can see on this graph here, fall outside of that uh, correlation between body weight and longevity. If we plot that data a little bit differently, you can see all the mammals shown here in yellow. This time, um, the graph is of the log of the body mass with a longevity quotient. But the bats are shown in blue, and you can see that they do not fall along this baseline that the other mammals tend to fall along. They fall much further that they are much longer lived given their body size. And if you look at the, uh, the spot right at the top of the graph here, this is the uh, Brant's bat that lives up to 40 years despite being quite a small animal. 
Now, if we scale that 40 years to the size of a human being for body weight, this would be the equivalent of us living for 234 years, which is quite an impressive lifespan. Now, not only do bats, or many bats live a long time, but they tend to stay young and healthy as they get older. So they don't show a lot of the classical signs of age-related degeneration or age-related diseases. They tend to avoid cellular damage, telomere shortening, and it's almost unknown for bats to get cancer. So these bat genomes that we investigate could hold some secrets to how animals can live longer and stay healthy into old age. This is particularly relevant when we think of our own aging population and the challenges that uh, this aging population will face when it comes to age-related diseases and degeneration. We also know that bats are very good at resisting certain diseases. So many viruses circulate in populations of bats, as you can see in this table, viruses like Hendra virus, um, Lissa virus, which is a, a rabies-type virus, and Marburg virus. These are found in a number of different bat species around the world. But interestingly, these viruses uh, circulate in these populations and infect these bats, but the bats don't show the same kind of uh, detrimental consequences or morbidity that most other animals do when infected. And we think this might be due to some enhanced immune functions displayed by the bats. So if we can interrogate their genomes, we may be able to identify the genetic mechanisms that help these bats defend themselves from these viruses, and maybe even learn some tricks that could help us defend ourselves from similar infections. We also know that bats have um, very specialized sensory perception. We know, for example, and I think most people, when they think of bats, they're thinking perhaps of echolocation, the way that bats are vocalizing, listening to the echoes that come from those sounds, and using this to navigate via sonar. So they've evolved some very specialized navigation methods and uh, hearing pathways. But some bats also have specialized olfaction, especially uh, nectar-eating bats are able to track the plants that they're targeting over very large distances um, via scent. Something that's very particular to uh, my interest is how they interact with each other socially and how they learn their vocalizations. So this is a picture, I don't know how well you can see it, it often just looks like a big brown blur at the beginning, but what it actually is is hundreds of thousands of bats all clustered together in an individual cave roost. And a lot of bats have interesting social interactions and they use their vocalizations to interact socially. Now, this is something that humans do when we interact with each other, but we also learn how to use our vocalizations when we learn how to speak. And this is a trait that's shared with bats, but not many other mammals. So if we can understand how bats learn their vocalizations and learn to interact with these social vocalizations, we might be able to understand something about how social uh, vocal learning has evolved. So now that I've given you some examples of what we can learn by studying bat genomes, I want to switch to uh, showing you how we aim to achieve the goals of Bat1K. Well, firstly, we are using multiple sequencing technologies to produce chromosome-level um, assemblies, starting off with PacBio long-read sequencing, including 10x read clouds of Illumina short-read sequencing, BioNano optical mapping, and high c read pairs um, for structural mapping. And using these four technologies, our goal is to produce reconstructions that have a contig N50 of 1 meg or greater, a scaffold N50 of 10 meg or greater, and at least 90% of the contigs map to chromosomes, with a consensus accuracy of Q40 or better, which is a, a fairly common metric used by um, the Vertebrate Genome Project and the G10K Project, um, which we call the 342Q40 assembly. What's crucial for gaining these metrics is to have high molecular weight DNA. Now, you might imagine that does present somewhat of a challenge, particularly working in the field. This is a picture of uh, David Ray uh, collecting samples in a bat cave. Um, it's not always easy to collect these samples, but I think it's really important that when we're aiming to collect these samples, we are aiming uh, to collect multiple tissues. We've found that uh, tissues like spleen, lung, uh, liver, and muscle actually have produced very good results. But even more importantly, that these samples are immediately preserved. So, for example, flash freezing in liquid nitrogen. Again, presenting somewhat of a challenge when you're going out into the field, but it's where we get the best results to date. We also prefer at this point to uh, extract the high molecular weight DNA at the sequencing facility. So we're shipping the tissue as is, snap frozen, and extracting at the facility. 
And I know that there are uh, working groups within the Vertebrate Genome Project that are working to try and uh, optimize different methods of storage and extraction, and will, of course, be updating as uh, the working groups um, find uh, different ways of doing this. But for now, we are really looking at snap frozen tissue only extracted at the sequencing facility. And of course, it's important to have electronic or specimen vouchering. So uh, these may be deposited in the BAT1K consortium or in a um, um, museum specimen collection so that we can go back and reference the species that we've sequenced um, uh, in the future. Now, of course, what I've been talking about here is lethal sampling, and that just won't be possible for all species because there are rare or threatened species um, within the bat family tree. So as you can see from this graph, there are a number of species that are either threatened, near threatened, or data deficient. So we don't actually know how threatened or non-threatened some of those species are. So in these cases, it's important that we don't take an individual out of the population when we don't know what the effects of that might be. So when large biopsies such as liver or muscle are not possible, what we've been aiming to do is take <coughs> wing clips from the bats. This is because the wings of the bats regenerate, so we can take a small sample from the wing in a fairly non-invasive manner and establish primary cell lines. And this is just a primary cell line that we've established from the wing clip of the phylostomus discolor bat. And in this way, the aim is to be able to expand these cell lines and get more DNA that we can extract for the multiple sequencing technologies. So to date, we've been working, for, uh, working towards BAT1K in a three-phase structure, starting with phase one, where we are now, which is uh, sequencing one representative from each of the 21 BAT families. And I'm very happy to say that we actually have phase one fully funded uh, due to a few small grants, but largely funded by a grant led by uh, Jean Myers um, from the Max Planck Society, uh, allowing us to sequence all of uh, phase one of the project. So we have five uh, families already sequenced. Two of those families are already online at the Genome Arc website, Phylostomus discolor and Rhinolophus ferrum equinum. We also have uh, samples either pledged, collected, or sequencing underway for most of the remaining families. It's only three families we have missing at this point, and that's because the samples are a little harder to come by, given that they live in very specific niche uh, areas. So to give you an idea of the kind of data that we've been generating, I have some metrics for a few of our initial genomes. This is, uh, these are metrics based purely on the PAC bio sequencing um, that shows you that our contig and 50s are somewhere between 9 and 25 megabases, which we think is quite good. Um, I haven't shown uh, the extra um, technologies included yet because we're still working on the assembly and polishing, and those metrics will likely change a little bit over the coming months. But if we compare what we're getting with this PAC bio sequencing, which is on the left-hand side, to the existing genomes that were available online prior to BAT1K, we can see the improvement that this long read sequencing is giving us uh, in these metrics. So you can see that uh, in the past, there were thousands or hundreds of thousands of contigs. Used, uh, most of these were done with Illumina short read sequencing on the right-hand side, and the N50 was uh, a fraction of one. And even some of these genomes have been done previously with Illumina sequencing and newly again with PacBio, and you can see the improvement in the metrics is quite clear. Now, it's one thing to sequence the genomes and assemble them, but of course we don't want to stop there, and we think it's really important to have comprehensive genome annotation to make the genomes most valuable for the community and to answer the biological questions that we're addressing. And our genome annotation project is led by Michael Hiller at the Max Planck Institute in Dresden. And he's built a, a genome browser for the BAT1K, which is uh, currently in test phase, using multiple different sources of information to uh, annotate the genome, including RNA-seq and ISO-seq, as well as projections based on human and mouse genes, uh, mapped proteins, and de novo predictions. So comparative and conservation predictions are all really uh, great for uh, annotating a genome, but of course we do miss out something when we work only with predictions. Of course, if we're using human and mouse predictions, we may be missing some of the important differences that we find in the bat family tree. So I want to emphasize how important it is that we include functional data when doing these genome annotations. Um, in particular, in doing these annotations, what Michael has been finding is that only relying on conservation and comparison is specifically missing many first and last exons, obviously also alternative exons, and isoform information. 
So we're including wherever possible RNA sequencing from multiple different tissues to try and understand exactly what um, the different uh, gene expression patterns are. But again, just using short read RNA sequencing is missing out on some of this important information, including alternative UTR usage and isoforms and alternative exon inclusion. So we are also trying to include wherever possible isoseq from multiple tissues. And I think this has been really successful for us so far, so I just want to show some of the very preliminary data of what we've got from isoseq. This is work from Ksenia Lavrichenko in my lab, uh, working with p Discola ISO sequencing from brain and testes. What she found was if you look just exclusively at the brain, uh, these are transcripts that are found only in the brain and not in testes, you see about 31,000 different isoforms able to be detected. If we do the reverse and look for something that's only found in testes but not in brain, another 10,000 isoforms show up. And if we look for shared isoforms, another 15,000 that are found in both data sets. So you can see there's a huge wealth of different isoforms that we can detect just doing these two uh, tissues. What this means for our annotation is, now I'm going to show you here, this is a, a gene called GLUL. It's a brain-specific uh, gene. And these are, hopefully it's able to be seen, this is the gene model based on predictions and comparisons with, for example, human and mouse genes. But if we include the isoseq data from P. discolor for this gene, which is now shown here in purple, you can see that there's a lot more going on, particularly in 5' prime and 3' prime UTR usage and in alternative isoforms um, at multiple levels throughout the gene. So we're really missing out on this information if we don't go in and collect the functional data to understand the gene structure. So I'm going to finish up there, just directing everybody to our lovely website, bat1k.com. You can see lots of pictures of lots of different bats there. But more importantly, you can understand or learn more about the project, what the status of the project is, and who's involved. And I'd also like to encourage anyone who's interested in the project to actually sign up at our website. We're a very inclusive, open-door policy consortium. If you have any interest in working with these bat genomes or contributing to the project, please sign up and become part of the project, and you'll get regular updates about uh, our progress. So I'll just uh, leave you with this picture of the key players that have been really um, pivotal in getting this consortium running, our directors, our, um, steer our executive committee, and also our steering committee, um, particularly, especially involving bat biologists, ecologists, and conservationists. And with that, also, thank you for your attention.